afternoon. Well, welcome to this fourth panel today on new transnational realities. My name is Dr. Callum Nicholson. I am a fellow here at the Danube Institute. Uh, so today's panel, as I said, is new transnational realities. We're going to discuss the impact of progressive ideologies on Western norms of international law and global security, as well as their impact on institutions like the UN. We'll also discuss changing policies around energy and terrorism, as well as Russian post-Cold War energy policy. Uh, our speaker today is Professor David Martin-Jones. He's a visiting professor of the War Studies Department at King's College, the University of London, and is the author of the 2020 book, History's Fools, The Pursuit of Idealism and the Revenge of Politics. So uh, no further ado, I'll pass it on to David for his talk. And once he's talked, each of the panelists will uh, have uh, 12 minutes or so to respond. Um, I've got a presentation. Okay. Um, so this is Wokus Pocus. But before I talk about how um, West foreign policy is in such a sad state of affairs, um, one contribution to the growing burgeoning literature on geopsychology. Um, Michael Doran mentioned um, the importance of Alexander Dugin in this line of thought. And we should remember that the idea of geopolitics comes out of the end of the First World War, that um, it was the breakdown of the balance of power in Europe between 1914 and 18 that led to thinking about an alternative to the balance of power, which was how do you control the world island. And it was the thinking of geothinkers like Halford Mackinder, also at King's and Reading, like me, um, who developed the concept of the world island and the idea that a heartland power could dominate it. And the idea got taken up, of course, by Reich thinkers like Karl Haushofer and Karl Schmidt, who developed the notion that a dominant power on the heartland a telluric power, um, Schmidt calls it, could dominate the world continent and would render the alternative world order based on sea power, the Anglo-American world, uh, re render it irrelevant, basically. That, that's the, and Dugin picked up Schmidt, influences Putin, and Schmidt is also read in uh, Beijing. So, that's the linkage between geopsychology and geopolitics, I think. And to go on to how the West um, lost, um, well, uh, the first, is this, how do I work this? To the green button. Oh, the green button. Oh. I, I'm technophobic. So the end of history and, and a world, world order, or the lack of a world, world order, the philosopher Alec Verglin, another neglected dead white male, uh, observed that civilizations are lost long before defeat in battle. In the case of the Western European peninsula of the Eurasian world continent, it's lost even the will to defend itself. The owl of Mer Minerva, of course, flies at twilight, and we can now see through the interstating gloom how we have arrived at our current impasse, where an alliance of dictatorships threatens to dominate the world continent. Verglin also observed the shift in Western thought from religion to political religion and the attractions of a Gnostic or millenarian style of thinking to a certain type of mind, the kind of um, post-political um, idealist mind of what we can call woke, really. Uh, but the, the style has been long gestating in the West. This style under the rubric of critical, constructive, deconstructive approaches to knowledge came to dominate the university systems of the West and their wider impact on the media, politics, and business from the, and, and forms the mise-en-scene to our current ideological confusion. Classical liberals like Karl Popper and Raymond Aron saw it coming back in the late 60s. So I found this letter in the largely neglective archives of the LSE recently. I can send you the photocopy. It didn't work on a PowerPoint, so I just abstracted a few lines for it. 
Aaron, who was uh, re reflecting upon the student revolutions in, in Paris in, in 1968, and had wrote, written about their psychodrama to Popper saying, what's the state like in the UK? Pretty desperate, Karl replied. But he, he had, you know, being a, a product of Vienna, uh, he, 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 he read German thinking. And he could say of the key influences that affected our cultural, uh, or the cultural long march through the institution of critical thought, he wrote, I can only say that when I read Adorno and Habermas, I feel as though a lunatic was speaking. I've translated some of their sentences into simple German. Turns out either to be trivial, tautological, or pretentious nonsense. I completely fail to see why Habermas is reputed to have talent. He certainly did not have the good sense to resist the influence of a lying and intelligence-destroying university system. And Popper was always fond of uh, framing laws, of course, and one of the ones he came up with, bad and pretentious language drives out good and simple language, and once human language is destroyed, we shall return to the beasts, uh, which is where we're returning. <clears throat> Picking up this kind of line, uh, the psychodrama that he spoke about, Oliver Downer was uh, either intentionally or unintentionally channeling Raymond Aron, uh, who didn't say this in the UK, he had to say it at the Heritage Foundation in, in, in the States because he probably would be canceled in uh, London. Uh, observed belatedly but correctly that at the precise point when our resolve ought to be strongest, a pernicious new ideology is sweeping our societies. He is, of course, correct. But why is it his allegedly conservative government remains captured by elements of this pernicious ideology? We encounter it every day, whether in terms of our racism or the crimes by which we establish what passes for our civilization. It is somewhat odd that the UK and the US defend the export of liberal democracy to the Ukraine when its media, bureaucratic, and academic elites consider it the most oppressive, unjust, corrupt form of rule that has ever prevailed on the planet. How did we arrive at this perverse understanding? Well, it goes back. Um, it goes back to the 1990s and the emergence of social justice, um, social movements. But it was uh, probably in, in the context of the disappointment with the progressive vision that seemed to be offered after 1990, the third way vision of Blair and Clinton, and its intent to make capitalism socially unjust and globally accountable, which seemed to break down. So the transnational new left evolved after what we could call the dark enlightenment. The woke is awakened, right? It's, it's alf clarum, but it's a dark alf, alf, alf clarum. Um, the transnational new left experienced the dark enlightenment in order to take the end of history to its final emancipatory stage. This Olympian project prefers an imperial form of rule through supernatural, supernational structures like the EUN and the EU, which are superbly uh, manipulable to its ideology, and global forums advancing world government by judicializing political context, which is what the you know, peace through conversation, as um, Habermas would put it. In its imperial detachment, the transnational mind deplores the violence of non-state actors like Islamic State, but emphasizes, but empathizes, sorry, empathy's a big thing, with their alienation. It was after 1990 then that the study of international relations or international relations theory, for want of a better term, initially turned from realism to surrealism. New theories deconstructing the West showed that globalization exploited endlessly the non-Western other, uh, for, you know, the, the, the term that the post-colonial discourse theories, its only term, really. Uh, the war on terror and the identification of the West's Islamophobia gave the post-progressive left worldview added momentum. The financial crisis after 2012 and the COVID panic now have reinforced its dark liberation. It excuses even the most brutal theocratic totalitarian regimes as long as they oppose the United States and the capitalist status quo. This chiliastic movement's world purificationism contrasts a degenerate present with a utopian and globally emancipated um, future. So wokeism then can be described thus. 
The West is selfish, greedy, ruthless, racist, and exploitative, and heedlessly pollutes the earth under the thrall of a neoliberal empire run out of uh, the states, of course. People live in poverty, food is contaminated, products are artificial, wasteful consumption is compelled, indigenous groups are dispossessed, and nature itself subverted. The anti or alter globalization, as it's sometimes known, movement consists of transnational networks of NGOs, sympathetic academics, a lot of academics, indigenous peoples, and environmental activists. After 2011, those committed to this worldview uh, to quote, I think, John Font, uh, lead hundreds of activist groups and NGOs, conduct seminars and hold marches at international conferences, and conduct mass disruption of the Antifa and uh, Extinction uh, Rebellion varieties. Woke, from 2012, moved from the periphery to the mainstream media and into business. We've now got woke capitalism with their um, environmental, social, and uh, governance models. Um, into bureaucracy, so two generations of your best and your brightest educated in critical thinking um, leads to uh, you know, a, a bureaucracy in the West, the public service sector I was talking to with Tim just recently, are all infused with this ideological uh, thinking, as are our international or regional institutions. This transnational network of purified victims seeks an environmentally clean, culturally harmonious, politically just and sustainable world, liberated from both capitalism and carbon. Its various networks and movements struggle for an international regime of peace and justice. The woke movement's ideology is thus post-democratic. It favors direct participatory action where grassroots activists raise the consciousness of um, the masses <laughs> whilst making them pay over the top for their energy and expose the toxicity of the liberal capitalist order. This purified global order will replace self-interested states and create a transnational therapeutic participatory absolutism. From this perspective, the global evil that the US-led liberal capitalist system perpetuates justifies resistance. Moreover, although these loosely structured conjuries of local groups embrace radical passivism, they nevertheless empathize with the grievances that motivate the global resistance of the leaderless variety. Resistance, as opposed to the more pejorative term terror, explains, for example, the insurgencies in Iraq after 2003. This demonization of Western influence fuels a relativist perspective that relates all subaltern violence to oppression and grievance settlement. But at the same time as the new homogenizing global project denounces Western hypocrisy, it minimizes the crimes that occur in regimes that its worldview considers colonized or non-Western. So where, where does this leave us, woke and the Europe question? So, um, a number of areas. Whilst Europe avoided geopolitics, it happened on its doorstep. The consequences of woke ideology are most evident, well, I've got four areas rather than three, actually. Uh, a weak, overstretched NATO and a divided EU, whose, to quote uh, Frederick the Great, diplomacy without an army is like an orchestra without instruments. And um, uh, I've got a, a short poem I thought I'd interject at this point as I've got a few minutes. Um, the great uh, neglected English poet of the uh, late 20th century, Philip Larkin, uh, wrote a marvelous couple of lines in 1969. When the Russian tanks move westward, what defense for you and I? The Colonel Slocum's Essex Rifles, the light horse of LSC. He was commenting on the time that Essex University was the center of yeah, wokeness in the 60s. We would now have Stephen Troop's Cambridge Rifles, I think, <laughs> but still the light horse of LSC. So um, when he was writing that in 1969, the British Army still had 50,000 troops on the Rhine. Um, now, all we've got is possibly a heavy brigade that we could send uh, to stop the Russian, uh, uh, the Russian tanks rolling. Um, and as someone pointed out, the British are more likely to send 
algorithms than infantry. So um, the weakness of NATO and a divided EU shows the West in, well, Europe, the Europe question becoming now so central. The further point is, of course, the implications of green think for Western foreign policy, saving the planet and abandoning the state. Environmental political thought has been immensely useful for undermining the integrity and the energy security of the West. And then, of course, we talked a bit about it, the problem of borders. Um, the EU, which the UK is supposed to be, you know, kind of collaborating with on the Ukraine problem, still insists on a border in the North Sea and uh, doing nothing about the migrant pro problem out of, uh, out of um, uh, Calais. Um, and the UK itself, you know, talk about United Kingdom, was supposed to come back with global, global Britain. It looks as John, uh, Jonathan Swift pointed out in uh, 1709, um, a, a kingdom, uh, what, who, whoever foresaw a united kingdom without faith or law? Well, we're back with that now. And finally, there's a post-colonial hangover that particularly affects the West generally. It's quite noticeable in UK foreign policy and as the bleeding of the... Um, the ideological at home into foreign policy mistakes. Um, the Barbados case, nobody really talks about this very much, but Barbados decided, a wealthy colony, ex-colony of the British, um, to abandon the Queen. Not with a, there was no referendum, it was done you know, um, completely by the ruling party with the support of China, because it's become part of the Belt and Road Initiative, and Charles, of course, goes over and apologizes for the deep stain of slavery that's left us with. And so to come back and finalize, this is the heartland of Mackinder's imagination with Chinese characteristics. Um, so the world continent, um, Russia is uh, allied with China, with this as the global ambition. They do geopolitics, we do woke foreign policy. Who will win? Mm. Leave that up to you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much, David. And our next speaker is actually presenting virtually, I believe by a recording. Um, it's uh, Michael Anton. He's a lecturer and research fellow at the Hillsdale Kirby Center of Government, the Graduate School of Government in the United States. So I believe the technical wizards will help us with the next section. All right, well, that was a, 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 a nice uh, setup, a, a perfect intro to what I was intending to say, which is essentially uh, to question or at least uh, warn or bring up some things that Hungarians in particular and other people, other peoples of the former Warsaw Pact nations ought to think about as they um, continue to align themselves increasingly with the West, but a West that is less and less Western and is more and more hostile to what I, as a, as a, as a conservative, philosophically and politically tend to think of as Western ideals. Um, we may go uh, back in time a little bit, a, a couple of decades to the end of the Cold War. Um, a debate broke out in the United States foreign policy community uh, in the uh, early 90s with the fall of the Berlin Wall, the breakup of the USSR. And we tend to think of that debate as, you know, uh, Buchananite, you know, after Pat Buchanan, isolationist, a scare word I try never to use, but that does get used a lot in America, on the one hand, and neoconservatives on the other hand. But it, it is useful to remember that certain people who were considered among uh, most important neoconservatives, such as Gene Kirkpatrick, uh, Ronald Reagan's ambassador to the United Nations, were on the more uh, uh, Buchananite side, if you will. She wrote an article that I would recommend everyone read called A Normal Country in a Normal Time. At any rate, the debate was the Cold War vested the United States and the Western alliance. Uh, uh, it, it caused them to take on a much more activist foreign policy than they'd ever contemplated before. The emergency being over, was it time to go back to normal or were these structures, we may call them the, uh, you know, uh, those who love these structures today like to refer to them as the rules-based international order or the liberal international order. Uh, but the institutions and concepts built in the, in the immediate post-war period uh, 
described by Dean Ashenson in his memoirs, Present at the Creation. And one side, let's call it the Buchanan uh, Kirkpatrick position was, no, the emergency is over. We can go back to normal. We can retrench. Doesn't mean we uh, can cut ourselves off from the world, but we can reduce our uh, uh, involvement in global affairs accordingly. And the other side said, no, no, this is, the, this is a moment uh, to be seized, uh, not to be squandered. The enemy is defeated. Uh, liberal, you, you know, not only have we won a great political victory, that is to say the United States and the Western Alliance, but we won this tremendous ideological victory. It's proved that liberal democracy is the only way forward for the world, and we ought to uh, press this advantage permanently. Now, clearly the latter argument won the day. I don't mean that necessarily on the merits, because I don't think they got everything right. <laughs> I'm not suggesting that, but as a matter of historical fact, they won the day. They set policy. They've been setting it ever since. And from that point on, you know, the question became, um, what does consolidating this moment and pressing the advantage look like? Well, one, one thing it looked like was NATO expansion. Okay, we all remember this debate. I, 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 I remember it. Um, and I understand from the perspective of, I'm speaking specifically to, uh, from the Hungarian perspective here, because you're, you're in, in, in Budapest, I apologize for not being able to be there. I had to teach a class all weekend this weekend. I had to teach a class tonight, so travel was impossible. I do hope to be able to get there, uh, hopefully twice it's looking like later this year. But in any event, the countries on the former Warsaw Pact, many of them were very desirous of joining NATO for reasons that I think are understandable in the context. Um, and I can boil down to two. One was sort of a, a matter of uh, prestige or symbolism of being finally a part of Europe as the phrase at the time and, and, there, and sometime thereafter had it whole and free after being forcibly separated from the rest of Europe, you know, to join that wider European community was desirous in and of itself for the symbolism and for the greater connectivity to European civilization. And the second was to be part of an alliance anchored by a great military and economic power that could protect the security of, of small countries that had suffered something that you know many other countries had never had to suffer, which is occupation and, a, and, and effectively a oligarchic government controlled by a, a foreign capital. So I, I understand why that happened. Um, another a parallel track, which happened a few years later, was joining the EU, um, which has gone through many iterations, as we've known, from the coal and steel to the economic community to the European Union and so on. But it only goes in one direction. That is to say, it only gets larger. It only gets more intrusive. It only gets bossier, in a sense, um, and, it, it, and, and, and it draws more powers and sovereignty to itself while it saps those from national capitals. And I think that these uh, countries in the, in the form of Warsaw Pact um, joined the EU for essentially the same reasons. But now these two ideas are, um, well, let me put it this way. The national policy, as I understand it, of Hungary and Poland and other countries is more and more in tension with the ideology of NATO and with the ideology of the EU. And I, I see that tension growing. I don't uh, see a, a resolution, um, a satisfactory resolution of it on the horizon. And I wonder where this is going to go. And I'm, I'm, I'm merely raising this as a, as a, as a question for people uh, and, and governments whose broader policy initiatives I, as a conservative, tend to agree with. So as I understand it, having never been to your country, but having read much about it, um, I, I will say this too. Um, Hungary is much in the news in the United States for uh, good and bad reasons. That is to say, many conservatives look to Hungary and say, I, I love what this government is doing from the outside. I mean, it, it wants to preserve its national character, wants to preserve its Hungarian character. It's taking steps to raise birth rates. It's protecting its sovereignty. You know, it's doing all kinds of things in the direct interests of the Hungarian people that many of us in the United States or, or in Western Europe wish our own governments would do, but that they don't do. Our own governments prioritize a kind of globalist order that we just heard about. Uh, they uh, increasingly prioritize a kind of aggressive wokeness um, that is uh, anti-Western, anti-human, even anti-civilizational at times. Um, and we look to you know these governments and we think, gosh, if only if only we had an Orban here or somebody who would think like that 
who would act in this way, right? So that's the, the, on the positive side. The negative side is the people really in charge of the West and its institutions. That is to say the, 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 the elected officials, the senior government bureaucrats, the tech executives, the bankers, everybody who really runs, uh, the university professors and administrators who really runs, runs the West. Um, they attack Hungary all the time. I'm, I, you don't need me to tell you this. I'm not bringing you any news here. But, uh, and, and these attacks are often um, irrational and vicious. You know, uh, Hungary is, is, is called illiberal and authoritarian. I mean, despite the fact that, as I understand it, uh, you know, these, these, these governments have, have won large majorities and they're about to go to a democratic election again uh, uh, around five weeks from now, is it, you know, five or six weeks from now. Uh, but the, the same way, any time a vote turns out the way that uh, what I like to call the regime here in America doesn't like, they call that uh, uh, undemocratic or a threat to our democracy. When the Hungarian people vote overwhelmingly for a certain thing, and then they, that government that they elect delivers on that certain, certain thing, those in the West attack it as undemocratic and, and illiberal. So my, my main point here is to ask the question, to raise the question. As an outsider, I'm not pretending to give you advice. I wouldn't take my advice anyway. I, you know, I, I think you should <laughs> settle your own affairs internally and not, uh, not be bullied or cajoled by what uh, others who aren't of your country think. But this alignment with the West that was sought in the 90s and in the early 2000s increasingly will, will, is putting, and I think will put your country and your countries, speaking more broadly to former Warsaw Pact nations, at odds with an increasingly globalist, transnational, woke um, West. The West that you want to join, or that I think Hungary wanted to join, or thought it was joining in the 90s, um, is no longer appreciably Western, or, uh, but is anti-Western, or has redefined the West in ways that aren't um, what you thought you were signing up for. Um, and I, I just I see this tension building. And personally, as a you know uh, um, as a nationalist myself, and as a fan of nations, I, I remember this isn't from the the famous 1978 Harvard speech, if, if I recall correctly. What I'm about to refer to is from Solzhenitsyn's Nobel Prize acceptance speech, in which he said, nations are the faces that God gives to humanity in the world. National characteristics make the world uh, richer and more interesting, and we shouldn't want to blend them away, homogenize them, um, you know, sand off the, the differences and make the whole world one thing. But that is what the people who lead the West not just in America right now, but I think in most of the Western capitals, whether it's it's elites in London or Paris or or Frankfurt or Australia or Ottawa, um, that's what they that's what they think and what they would like to do. And I think that's at odds with the policies that I see a country under its current government uh, in in Hungary and and in Poland and other countries doing. And I personally would would hate to see our Western leaders succeed in doing that. And I do whatever I can do to fight against it in, in, in writing and speaking um, as a, you know, just a, an intellectual, and there's not much I can do except write and speak out against it. But this alignment, I think, will increasingly put you at odds with those elites and at odds with the stated policy of your government and at odds with what it appears to me to be your people want, right, which is to remain Hungarian into the future. Um, so, I mentioned NATO earlier, and I, I want to just say something about that as we seem to be on, uh, perhaps on the precipice of some kind of crisis, which I hope doesn't come. Um, I'm a little bit buoyed by the fact that we've been told a number of times that the invasion starts you know, on a specific day at a specific time, and then the invasion didn't happen. Uh, I hope that these um, pronouncements continue to be false going on into the future, because I really would not like to see uh, a war in Europe or, or anywhere else for that matter. But um, I'm, I'm yoking your country to an alliance that seems to be, whose leaders seem to be increasingly disconnected from reality and increasingly reckless, can be dangerous going on in the future. I honestly, I, I worked in the U.S. National Security Council for a total of six years in two different stints. You'd think I would have some insight into what these people are thinking, and I've tried to read a lot about what's going on in Ukraine and read the statements of the president and of the National Security Advisor and of the Secretary of State. I don't know what they're doing or what they're thinking. It seems to me to be incredibly reckless and foolish. Um, uh, but if, if they end up precipitating a war, which I 
I'd like to believe that's not what they're trying to do, but I um, kind of fear that they may blunder into that inadvertently, if not advertently, um, being a part of the alliance and obviously being much closer to that part of the world than the United States is means that a country like Hungary, other countries in, in other new entrants into NATO or, or late entrants into NATO in the 1990s will be much more vulnerable to harm from whatever catastrophe precipitates if one should happen. And that's another thing that Hungarians, I think, need to think about very, very carefully. Do you want to be yoked to an alliance whose leadership is um, no longer thinking clearly and thinking cautiously about these great issues? Um, and I guess my, my final thought would be, I did say that um, you know, Hungary is much talked about in the United States from the positive and from the negative side. Uh, I, I, another country much talked about in the United States is Russia. Almost all of the talk is negative. Um, to bring up Russia in the United States and not immediately condemn it as some kind of you know, neo-fascist authoritarian state, uh, an implacable enemy of the United States about to go on a wartime rampage, it is to be called a traitor. To basically to say anything but Russia and Putin are evil, you, you open yourselves up to the charge of treason in the US media and in uh, intellectual circles today. It's a kind of crazy state of affairs. Um, that's not to excuse everything Russia does or to say that um, the United States has no problems or difficulties with Russia, but um, we just have a very one-sided conversation about Russia in the American press, in the American intellectual circles today. Um, but if, if I understand Hungarian domestic policy correctly, it is to keep Hungary Hungarian for as long as possible, increase the population, increase the sense of national pride, increase the sense of cultural, ethnic, civilizational identity, exactly what we're not doing in the USA today or in the broader West. Um, Russian domestic policy seems to be similar in that respect. I, it seems to me that Russia, um, in many of its leading intellectuals and philosophers see Russia as a kind of civilization or the, as the heart of a civilizational state, an orthodox civilizational state. We can, since I've mentioned some journal articles earlier, I, I teach to my students every semester Samuel Huntington's classic uh, clash of civilizations from, as I recall, 1994. And he identifies like eight civilizational blocks with the orthodox being one of them with Russia at its heart. And Russian policy seems to want to preserve and protect that civilizational identity going forward. Uh, I know that Hungary doesn't, is not part of that civilizational block, doesn't see itself as part of that civilizational block, but sees itself as part of the West, um, but ironically part of a West that finds that mission antithetical to what it has redefined Westernism to be. And domestically, um, Hungarian policy and the, the, the wishes, the, the of the Hungarian people seem to perhaps have more in common with Russia's self-identity as a civilizational bloc than with the leading lights of the West in Washington, wherever we call them in Washington, London, Paris, who see the core identity of the West as getting beyond any kind of Western identity into some sort of transnational or even transhuman way of looking at things. And uh, this tension to me is one, just to get back to the, the, the basic point, is one that I think is, is growing and not shrinking. I don't see how it can easily be resolved. And my own personal preference would be aligned with those of the Hungarian people, which is that Hungary remain Hungarian, just as I would like France to remain French, Italy to remain Italian, and so on. Uh, I'd like to see, I, I don't, I'm, I'm not afraid of nationalism. I'm not, I don't find it inherently authoritarian or any of these things. I think I agree with Solzhenitsyn that nations are the faces that God gives to the world and that these things ought to be preserved for the richness and betterment of mankind. And I wish the Hungarian people uh, every success in, in preserving their national identity and their civilization. Thank you very much to Michael Anton. Our next speaker is Dr. Jeremy Carl. He's a senior fellow at the Claremont Institute in the United States, but he's also a visiting fellow and our colleague right now here at the Danube Institute. So uh, the floor is yours, Jeremy. Thanks very much. Okay, we on? Good. Um, and uh, thank you uh, to my colleague, Michael, uh, for his uh, comments uh, that I'm going to actually be following up on a fair bit. This, this uh, panel is called Transnational Realities. And so I want to talk about uh, democratic sovereignty and transnationalism in two different ways. 
that democratic sovereignty is being eroded right now from two different kind of uh, vectors. The first is sort of the NGOs and international organizations, and the second is supranational organizations. And the overall phenomenon that's been driving this is uh, something called uh, wokeness, as was referred to by our initial speaker, but because we're at a serious academic conference in which he threw around the name of a number of impressive philosophers, I'm also going to use a sort of more formal name, uh, transnational progressivism. And uh, transnational progressivism is a, coin, a term coined about two decades ago by a Hudson Institute scholar and, and friend of mine named John Fonte. Uh, and it has a number of key characteristics that I think we're seeing today that make it very useful as an analytical tool. First, uh, it ascribes group over the individual citizen and nation. Uh, secondly, there's a dichotomy of groups. There's oppressors and there's these oppressed. Third, the values of all dominant institutions are changed to reflect the perspective of victim groups. Fourth, there's a sort of uh, imperative of democratic transformation or demographic transformation rather. And fifth, ultimately a deconstruction of demographic and national uh, narratives and symbols. And I think you see this in spades right now in the West, and John um, uh, touches on this in his book, uh, Sovereignty or Submission, and Michael touched on it in some of his remarks. So where do we see transnational progressivism? We see it today, uh, this global governance, in a variety of institutions. We see it in the International Court of Justice, the European Court, NGOs, academia, big tech, uh, you, you kind of name it, multilateral institutions, and they create so-called norms that are not in fact norms, but in fact are simply a combination of the will to power and the policy preferences of a left-wing global elite. Um, and we need to be clear when we talk about transnational progressivism that it's ultimately in opposition to democratic governance. And by democracy in this case, I mean a regime that is defined by democratic representation, sovereignty, majority rule, and national citizenship. Ultimately, transnational progressivism speaks the language of bureaucracy and not democracy. Um, so when it comes to transnational progressivism or democracy, we can have one or the other, but we can't have both. Um, the first way that transnational progressivism is instantiated through these NGOs and, and similar sorts of organizations, I, I just wanna talk about them first. Um, it's often th these groups that are frustrated by their lack of democratic progress within a nation state, you know, within valid channels as I, I would perceive it. So then they look to kind of non-democratic bodies to get their policy preferences enacted, um, and they're appealing to sources outside of their own democratic accountability. I'll give you an example, and this was actually the example that originally um, uh, influenced Dr. Fonte's analysis, looking at the, uh, at the United Nations, the first it was the World Conference Against Racism in 2001, where 50 NGOs called on the United Nations High Commissioner for Human Rights to pressure the United States to address, in quotes, the intractable and persistent problem of racism in the US, and that came with a list of demands. You may see this, of course, echoing in a lot of our discourse, in fact, in the United States right now, for those of you who follow the US. And yeah, my personal view on the US, of the UN, rather, is, there are uses for the UN. I, I, there's, it's important to have a forum where, where everybody can kind of meet. But the acceptance of this fundamentally non-democratic body as a legitimate source for somehow global governance in which NGOs bypass democratic accountability is just not acceptable. Uh, not able to bend American authorities to their own visions of racism, these NGOs attempted to accomplish through global governance means uh, what they could not accomplish through democratic ones. So let's talk about some other examples and we'll shift now to talk a little bit about Hungary. And these do not involve NGOs directly, but they involve the supranational institution of the EU. And look, I mean, there's lots of things that Hungary has done recently that a lot of Western European leaders haven't loved. But it's, it's ironic to me that the real tripwire, the Rubicon that could not be crossed, was Hungary's refusal to promote something for children that was legally banned for to varying degrees, even among adults in the Western world until for most of the last century. Um, and I'm referring of course to the Hungarian law passed on homosexuality, promoting homosexuality and transgenderism uh, to children uh, that was passed last year. And never mind that this was very popular here. A number of us had the good fortune to meet with the prime minister uh, last week. And he told us, you know, he viewed this as basically a 90-10 issue among 
Hungarians. Um, never mind that it affected only minors. It had absolutely zero effect on the private behavior of consenting adults. Never mind that Budapest has a 20,000 person pride parade every year. Uh, Hungary's exercise of democracy and democratic choice, and nobody suggested that this was not the democratic choice of the Hungarian people, offended the social values of transnational progressive EU and therefore had to be stopped. Dutch Prime Minister Mark Rutte said, in quotes, the long-term goal is to bring Hungary to its knees on this issue. That is pretty provocative language for a country that has suffered a great deal under the iron boot of foreign occupation over the last century. Uh, Rutte, 54, single and childless, is the living embodiment, in my view, of the European ruling class's will to self-destruction and non-existence. Um, but this is not merely an idiosyncratic opinion that he had. 17 of the 28 EU states uh, signed on to a statement denouncing this law. And Ruta said, if you don't like it, there's an alternative. Leave the EU. He talked about it. I've never seen uh, EU leaders speaking so plainly before. EU values essentially demanded this, according to Ruta. So what we are being told here is that EU values demand that the promotion of transgenderism to children is more sacred than democracy, okay? And I actually believe that that is the view of the EU elite when it comes right down to it. They don't like to say it in those sorts of terms, but that, that's what they believe. So um, we saw a similar pattern play out here in Hungary with respect to migration, where recently the European court ruled that Hungary had violated EU laws on asylum and immigration. Prime Minister Orban noted, it doesn't matter what the European court has ruled, Hungary must continue to defend its borders. Uh, and this, I think, gets to the heart of it. Uh, the EU is currently conceived by treating goods as same as people, essentially by making people, there's no difference between people and objects, just people in the economy. I think as soon as you did that, you're lost to a degree in my view. I think it's great to have free flow of goods and, and you know, open trade. Um, I think maybe even as a default, it's fine to have a free flow of people as a kind of baseline condition. But if you're going to say as a matter of law that there is no distinction between citizen and non-citizen, that a country cannot control its borders, then in what sense is it a country anymore? Okay. Um, somehow I don't think that when the European people got together in 1951, or rather when European bureaucrats did it, to develop the European coal and steel community to regulate coal and steel trade, that people thought they were signing up for this, the people of Europe. Um, so we have increasingly ruled, not by governments, but by NGOs. Uh, George Soros is supposed to have unlimited right, unalienable right, to create NGOs to interfere in elections here. We've certainly seen in the US the catastrophic effect that Soros has had on our own politics, where he's floated millions of dollars into low profile races that have fundamentally weakened crime and enforcement and punishment in some of our largest cities to catastrophic consequences. Furthermore, international NGOs is seen as having a right as quote unquote civil society organizations to undermine Hungary's borders. And again, when Hungary tried to pass a law saying in fact this should not be allowed, uh, there were howls from uh, the EU and bureaucratic organizations. So if Hungary's democratically elected supermajority in parliament changes laws and policies so that unlike the Europe and America, the media and universities don't universally embrace a global left-wing perspective. Somehow democratic norms have been violated. If you read the liberal media in the West, that's what you would think. Um, and the only real fundamental norms I would argue have been violated here are the norm of liberal privilege and the feeling that all of these institutions must ultimately be under the domain of transnational progressives. And again, I think Prime Minister Orban said it nicely. He said, for, the, for them, the rule of law is a tool in which they can mold us in their image. And I think this is increasingly the role of transnational progressives everywhere. Uh, and I think their attitudes and behaviors are the, one of the gravest fundamental threats to democratic self-determination in the 21st century. And I should add here that uh, John O'Sullivan sitting right in front of me, uh, president of the Danube Institute, and certainly someone not uninterested in European affairs, has long been one of the prime motivators of pushing back, particularly with respect to his home country of Britain, this type of Euro overreach um, that has gone on um, uh, for, for decades. Um, and uh, uh, I will close with this, uh, that Prime Minister Thatcher, who uh, John O'Sullivan uh, worked with very closely for a number of years and a great friend of the Hungarian people, 
said in a speech a few years after leaving office, if you were to create a supranational European Federation and the people could no longer hold their national parliaments to account, extremism could grow only further. And I think that's exactly what we're playing with. We're seeing a reaction, sometimes an overreaction, but a, a fundamentally understandable reaction just in the, the kind of weight of geopolitics to this unaccountable bureaucratic overreach from these transnational progressives and the unaccountable bureaucratic organizations which they oversee. Um, an overpowerful supranational EU that is dedicated to progressivism will ultimately lead to resistance. That's one choice and maybe even extremism. Um, or we can have limited supranational bodies that respect national sovereignty on issues where member states disagree. And again, Prime Minister Orban said, there, there's no other solution, only tolerance. This is the only way we can find a common path. And I, I think that's, again, right in all of its generalities. It's, that's, that is the correct vision. And it only remains to be seen whether this is a vision that our current transnational uh, progressive elites can join us in embracing. So thank you. Thank you very much, Jeremy. Sorry. So our next speaker is Timothy Egan, and he's president and CEO of the Canadian Gas Association. Thank you, Callum, and thank you, John and Melissa, uh, and your wonderful team for your hospitality and for inviting me to join you today. I'm, uh, as Callum noted, president and CEO of the Canadian Gas Association. So it's a trade association representing the natural gas industry in Canada. I'm not here speaking in an official capacity. I'm speaking in a personal capacity, but I'm reflecting, if you will, from the front lines picking up on David's uh, introductory remarks, the front lines of how wokeism plays out in respect to energy. And I'm gonna talk particularly about how it plays out in respect to the issue that has become the dominant issue in the conversation around energy in the world today, and that's climate change. Now, earlier in the day, we talked about a variety of geopolitical issues touching on energy, the sort of traditional ones we think about, the race for resources, the efforts to build key infrastructure or to, or to control key passages for the movement of energy um, that are playing out in a very real way in the European uh, world as we speak. Um, but climate change has become an energy issue, uh, a geopolitical energy issue of a different sort, and it's become an incredibly powerful one. Um, just how powerful? Well, Bloomberg reported um, just last week in, in a report they released in anticipation of the Munich Security Conference on some polling data that they had done in about 12 leading um, uh, economies around the world. Uh, they polled 12,000 people in those economies, and those 12,000 people indicated that their number one concern was not war, was not anything other than climate change. Now, I didn't see the polling questions, and polling questions can be written in a variety of ways, but nonetheless, it's significant that that was listed as, as the priority issue, and I don't doubt that many people are concerned about climate change. Um, uh, but I'd argue that, in fact, that concern has become a kind of obsession, and I think that's really what, what David was getting to with his remarks about wokeism. And what I see is a claim that's held as a truth by an astounding number of people that we're in the midst of an apocalyptic moment for which we somehow need to be punished. And this claim has led to a mindset that doesn't tolerate debate, either about the scope and scale of the challenge we face or about how we should face it. And the consensus view seems to be that the response needs to involve a wholesale, top-down restructuring of the energy systems of the modern world. There's a kind of ideological zeal that there is a right way and a wrong way for states and any mediating institution to act. And the wrong way is any continuation of anything we've done. And the right way is massively interventionist, it's top-down, it's publicly financed, and it's uncaring about anything other than emissions reductions. And this, I believe, is incredibly dangerous and, needless to say, geopolitically destabilizing. To have this mindset and then to have it inform very prescribed national and international policy frameworks is not, I would submit, in our collective interests. If governments feel compelled to conduct all activities through the lens of how it affects climate change and helps us address the so-called climate crisis, and every other consideration is secondary, we're endangering our own, we are endangering our own well-being, and I suspect doing very little for the climate. And it's worse with energy policy, which has de facto in many of the world's more advanced economies really become climate policy. 
Now, I was, I was enjoying many of the presentations early in the day from some of our e East European colleagues where this is not the case because you're dealing with some very real issues about, about meeting very specific energy needs. But I'd argue that it is the case in much of the Anglosphere. Um, and you might say, but well, there is a climate crisis. Perhaps you feel that way. And this policy focus is necessary because everything else turns on whether we can survive the crisis. But to that, I'd say in respect to any crisis, the most strategic response is a multifaceted one that allows you to address all dimensions, a response that draws on a wealth of innovative ideas and technologies that calls on the broadest genius of humanity, not any particular path. But that's not what's happening with the energy policy response on the idea of a climate crisis. I'm going to give you five, five dimensions of, of, of how this is playing out. In respect to its social dimensions, I'd say a climate crisis would affect most aggressively the least fortunate in the world. The roughly 25% of the world's population that live without the most basic energy services. Without those services, they are most vulnerable to the negative effects of whatever uh, uh, climate disaster you might want to think about. And therefore, we should encourage any effort to get them those basic energy services as quickly as possible. But this means putting in place the conditions to build as quickly as possible energy generation and transmission and distribution systems that can get people out of poverty quickly, because reducing poverty is the best means to improve people's well-being, environmental or otherwise. But the response instead seems to be, yes, but you must not do that with coal, you must not do that with oil, you must not do that with gas, We'd really, frankly, rather you not do it with nuclear. So we sanction moves to ban, or at least dissuade, the development of those resources and technologies that use them. In respect of its physical dimensions, I say that a climate crisis means extremes that will test the resiliency of energy systems. So you need to ensure that you have systems that have the most redundancy in place. And key to this is that I use the word in its plural form, systems. There isn't a single energy system in any society that's really economically robust. So that means avoiding a policy bias to try to build a single system. You need to build parallel energy transmission and distribution mechanisms. So that means roads and rail lines to move liquid fuels. It means pipelines to move gaseous fuels. It means electricity uh, high voltage lines uh, to move electrons. And you need as many of those wherever you can. The multiple fuels and technologies are what provide for resiliency for any society. And the point is to do as much as possible to give you redundancy, so that when something fails, something else is there to back it up. But instead, the response seems to be, build an electric system for all your energy needs and use wind and solar for it. In respect to its political dimensions, I say that, there's a, if, that if there is a climate crisis, you want always to be cognizant of the fact that there are those who will seek to take advantage of that crisis to undermine you. Malicious actors, state or otherwise, will try to sow seeds of dissent within your political system to fund interests in your country that will undermine your ability to address the social and physical measures you're trying to establish. And so you should be on high alert for such influences. You should endeavor to expose them and outperform them in the case of the malicious state actors, not offer them as models to replicate. And yet the response seems to be, ah, but country X has committed to net zero by such and such a date. We should do the same by an even earlier date. Even though country X clearly has no intention of doing what it says. And in respect to its economic dimensions, the climate crisis is best addressed by ensuring a more robust economy. The most advanced economies are the most capable of responding to any crisis because they have the wealth, the mediating institutions, the civil society, the social well-being necessary to do so. So that would mean you take measures to allow for economic growth everywhere. And you take measures to enable more competition to ensure as much technological innovation as possible to drive further economic growth. But the response seems to be developing countries should develop their economies in the ways we tell them to in order to solve global problems. And finally, in respect to energy in a climate crisis, you would seek to maximize the effectiveness of every fuel and every technology to manage your impacts. You wouldn't pick favorites. You wouldn't identify preferred pathways or ban options. You'd invite all comers to seek improvements to the systems, to the fuels they're using, so that the cream can rise to the top. But instead, the response seems to be, we can only use certain fuels or certain technologies and not others, as though we have some complete knowledge now of how our performance might improve. So those seized with the idea of a climate crisis seem entirely fixated on particular targets, 
and particular dates and on a series of very aggressive and particular measures to achieve them. They are not taking and even refuse to entertain a broader strategic approach to our collective energy future. And the consequences are increasingly apparent in those countries most aggressively embracing this agenda. Exploration and development of critical resources is declining. There are more and more instances of supply constraints. There is growing evidence that infrastructure is becoming less reliable. Prices are rising in many instances dramatically and at significant cost to customers. Particular technologies are being significantly subsidized without clear long-term benefit and at great cost to national treasuries. State-owned enterprises from countries hostile to open and transparent markets are gaining global influence and more. All of this is, again, from a geopolitical perspective, destabilizing. I haven't commented on whether or not I think there is a climate crisis. My point is that our response to the climate question has, be, has been narrow, naive, and strangely ideological, and therefore it is geopolitically harmful. It's setting back the well-being of nation states that are critical to global security and well-being, and doing nothing to address a great number of real global challenges. This, this isn't a recipe to address a crisis. It's a recipe to exacerbate existing ones and create new ones. The geopolitical challenge of the environmental impacts of energy is not that we can't manage our emissions or their effects. It is that at a more fundamental level, we have convinced ourselves that we are bad actors and that only particular courses of action are acceptable to redress the wrongs we have committed. The result is a public discourse that is increasingly removed from the reality of how energy is actually produced, that has lost sight of the fact that with energy we have to be concerned not just about the environment, but equally about how we keep things affordable so people can live their lives, how we keep things reliable so systems don't fail. The irony of the present moment is that those same countries indulging in this, what is frankly a self-loathing discourse, are better equipped than they ever have been in history to guarantee their own energy independence, to deliver technological innovation to the world to vastly improve the well-being of millions and to address a whole range of environmental challenges through that innovation. The effects of the present moment are increasingly negative and serve the interests of those opposed to free, peaceful and prosperous societies. Thank you. Thank you very much, Timothy. We're a bit short of time and Professor Kaplan's asked, uh, he sacrificed himself for the, the good of the rest of the panel here in terms of the uh, timekeeping. We're going to move on to Alex Kishuta. Alex is a, a writer, a cultural critic, and a podcast host based in Transylvania. So welcome, Alex, and uh, go right ahead. Thank you. Hopefully this, this works. Good. Move closer to, to this, and uh, I needed a, a prop. <laughs> so um, uh, I think everyone will be grateful if I skip my short introduction to wokeness at this point. <laughs> I think everyone knows if they've seen any of the recorded struggle sessions from uh, from American universities, um, the the meek professors, the uh, the very um, vehement students, um, and if they've ever had contact with an HR person in the last five years, they know what I'm speaking about. Um, Essentially, there is a, a cast of people that have, have grown out of the wokeness uh, movement. There is an anti-woke cast of people, a, a priestly cast that is here to interpret what is wokeness, where does it come from, I am adjacent, maybe I can be described as one of these people. I run a podcast and I invite a lot of people that are in this space on it. Um, so essentially what, what we've been trying to find out is not only, okay, well, where, where does it come from? Uh, it is obviously a very old phenomenon. If we, if we think about, um, let's say, a, a book like um, James Burnham's Suicide of the West, published in 1964, uh, it sounds and reads like it was written yesterday. Um, the before mentioned actually the, the Solzhenitsyn speech from uh, from 1978, a world split apart, essentially uh, documents the same phenomenon as well. So these are very old things. The the West has been already described as a um, as an empire that is in a, in a phase of decline, um, with low courage, um, low belief in its founding principles, uh, and an idea that um, the, the concept of evil is something that is, uh, is a problem in the system. If you can just uh, create a system that is, that is resistant to evil, you, we can lead to a, a, a utopian, we can lead our peoples to a utopian future where, um, where the, the human uh, element is, um, is coded out. We, we don't need to deal with all of this stuff. Um, so essentially, um, a lot of people who are in my space have different, um, 
different interpretations of what happened. So some say it is a, a virus of a, a French origin that's infected the institutions about maybe 1950s, 1960s, and it's trickled its way into, into everything. Um, other people say that it is the, 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 the lingering spirit of Christianity in a, in a post-Christian materialist world. Um, and others say it is essentially the final stage of the liberalism of, of John Stuart Mill, trying to unshackle people from their, their own chosen bonds uh, and, and free them into this uh, world where everything is decided by the rational individual uh, and, and nothing is decided by, um, by, yeah, by the unchosen bonds. Um, essentially, all of these could be true, but um, as I said, these things are, are, have been bubbling underneath the surface for a very long time. Um, one thing that is clear to me is that for our current situation, wokeness is necessary. If we didn't have wokeness or any, anything like it, like a, a universalist creed to, to function as the, the avant-garde of, of global uh, liberal democracy, it, it would have to be invented. Um, because it global liberal democracy essentially requires the assumption of, of equality. If you want to have people participate in, um, in, in community and in being the producer consumer that, that global liberal democracy requires, this would have to be done um, through, uh, through a universalist creed. It is, um, without this role and, in, and the meritocracy that it implies, it, it deflates deflates all of these assumptions and it, it's, it just doesn't work. You also couldn't have the appearance of fair trade. You would not be sustaining it without the insistence that everyone is fundamentally equal and has the same goals and aspirations. Um, so people become a very poor target for both commerce and politics once this assumption is, is dissolved. Um, so. And its power and, and the necessity of wokeness is also uh, driven home by the fact that countries tend to be in, in what is essentially an arms race. Once you have interconnected um, collaborative systems, once you have uh, commerce at that level, once you have um, the internet essentially, you cannot stay behind. Staying in place means remaining behind. So and anything from resources, military capacity, economic potential, in a world where things scale exponentially, there is a need to not undermine your potential uh, to keep up, collaborate, and scale along with it. So wokeness at this point, for most co countries, is a competitive necessity to just stay ahead. So the ethic of universalism is needed as the basis of expansion. Um, so um, no regime has ever existed without uh, a metaphysically anchored value hierarchy. And wokeness acts as the metaphysics of global liberal democracy. Um, and the objection typically is that if, if every regime needs a metaphysics, me metaphysics, why is this one bad? Or why, why isn't this one you know, enough? Or why isn't diversity a, a good creed? Um, firstly, this system is, is anti-human, it is anti-nature, um, and it does not suffer competition kindly. Uh, whatever your unchosen bonds, your family, your religion, your community, um, even the parameters of your natural body now have to go. Uh, by definition, these things are uh, local, they're exclusionary, they're, they're parochial, um, and they are reactionary. Um, tomorrow's society is composed of, of free-floating godlike entities living out their authenticity in flux through ever more granular consumption and identity decisions powered by science and robots and uh, in a pinch by a sweatshop somewhere far away. You may be allowed to enact your formal allegiances as a fetish somehow, sometimes, um, but only after they've been thoroughly hollowed out. You could maybe go as a sexy nun on Halloween. Um, until every country in the world becomes a liberal democracy, until there is, um, uh, which could be uh, a bit heavier on the liberal and maybe imperceptibly light on the democracy end, uh, the engine of progress must keep spinning. Um, another problem with, with the brand of wokeness that we're seeing is the speed and the virulence. So if your child uh, owns a device like this or any sort of device that's connected to the internet and has even a minor functioning uh, screen, this is there. This is the fundamental software that is running uh, the mommy bloggers, the travel influencers, the any sort of person that has a public profile and is not explicitly conservative uh, is running a version of the software. 
Um, it also fulfills some essential functions that have been left open by the decline of these unchosen bonds, by the decline of religion, of community. Uh, it gives meaning. Uh, it is essentially, as, as was mentioned here before, it is, it is a millenarian aspiration, uh, the idea that um, you know, we can create heaven on earth, and who wouldn't want to sign up to that? Uh, and so people are joining this ideal in, in droves. Um, and it also fulfills another essential function, that of, co of conferring status. So this is um, essentially a creed that flows from the highest echelons of, of, global, of the global priestly caste. So these are things that are cooked up in the Ivy League, uh, in places with names like Harvard, uh, Yale, places that even you know, my grandmother in, in rural Romania would, would know about. So these are very high status places, and it is also a very complex ideology, that one that cannot be uh, learned by someone who does not speak English, someone that uh, does not have the connections to these places. So it is very high status, also in its complexity. You need to be a person of leisure to actually have the time to absorb all of the, the updates to the software. Um, so that also adds to the exclusivity of, uh, of, of wokeness. Um, but even though it is an elite creed, uh, wokeness is not bulletproof. And this is what we're seeing now, and this is what is heartening about it. Um, wokeness is a, is a hothouse plant. It does not survive in reality. It survives off the fumes of a decaying empire, um, and it might do so for a very long time, depending on how, what the quantity of these fumes is. Um, but places who need a, a serious link to reality, places like Hungary in, in that vein, um, cannot adopt wokeness because, um, as I said, for example, you would need to win a war, to build a bridge, to, to do any sort of thing that requires a test of reality, one must put function before, before ideology. And this is something that wokeness fails at. Uh, and it fails at it in increasingly embarrassing ways, which alienates the elites that actually um, are there to propagate it. So I think the, the future of any sort of creed that wants to compete with wokeness is in, um, in taking advantage of this embarrassment, which is becoming more and more obvious, uh, and in attracting these counter elites to um, a similar metaphysical vision, because that's, that's what it has to be, uh, but one that um, embraces more um, pro-social <laughs> values and one that is not essentially hitching your, your wagon to, to entropy itself. So um, with that in mind, um, I'm, I'm very happy to be in Hungary and I think this is one of the, the maybe the first places to turn the tide on, on a movement that's been, that's been sweeping the continent uh, and its and, you know, adjacent imperial outposts, <laughs> even like Romania, for a very long time. Thank you very much, Alex. And finally, moving to our final speaker is uh, my colleague David Dusenbury, Dr. David Dusenbury, a fellow at the Danube Institute and author, and also currently my co-host on the Chainbridge podcast, which we're about to start. So please listen to that online. Um, go ahead, David. Well, I will, I will keep my re remarks very brief indeed, um, but I appreciated Alex's a great deal. And um, her stress on the fact that every regime not only has but needs a metaphysics uh, segues rather nicely into what I would like to say in just about four or five minutes. And that is that Europe historically has a metaphysics. It is a, an elevated metaphysics which asserts uh, intrinsic human dignity it asserts the unity of humankind. It strives for global peace. It um, gave rise to due process and the concept of the individual in the late medieval period. And um, of course, this metaphysics, which we have inherited and in the ruins of which we are living, is Christianity. It is the church, it is the churches, which you also alluded to the fact that the churches are not always stalwart in their opposition to some of the uh, some of the tendencies we've been discussing but nevertheless the point I want to make is just very very simple and is uh, prominent by its absence today and that is um, one of the questions posed in the description of the conference is will the West survive and I personally have come to 
be convinced that the answer is without Christianity, no. The West will not survive. And I think it, it is one of the great beauties of the legacy which we have inherited that um, it not only allows us to hope for the preservation of our ways of life, our nations, our national cultures, but it also allows us to assert them and identify with them in a way that does not put us at odds with the other peoples of the world, the other nations of the world, many of whom I would like to underscore are Christian. And one of the things I find most winsome and beautiful about uh, Hungarian uh, policy of, of recent years, which uh, my colleague, Dr. Kaplan, knows more about than I do, is their uh, systematic, programmatic efforts to care for and defend the, uh, the, the rights of Christians around the world who are facing uh, programmatic persecution. And um, so I, I would just like to close with this very, very brief note. I could say much more, that um, as we strive to roll back some of the, uh, the hostile movements which we're facing. I think we can do so in full confidence uh, in the, the intellectual and the cultural legacy, which in various ways I think we all uh, inherit and represent. Well, thank you very much, David, and thank you very much to the panel. These have been a fascinating set of uh, statements. Um, and uh, so we're a bit tight for time, and I hate to get between anyone on a coffee break, but we're actually we're going to go straight on um, just to the uh, final speaker of the next panel, the concluding address of Dr. George Freeman, who will be introduced by Anton Bendisevsky. So he's going to come on now, I believe, but the panel, we can all... Uh, uh, vacate the panel. So thank you very much from our panel, and um, the, uh, we'll go straight on to the next speaker. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Callum, for the introduction. Uh, please don't go away, so we'll continue for, um, for the next uh, uh, panel, for the next uh, concluding um, remarks um, from our next speakers, speaker who unfortunately can be here, so it will be a recorded uh, message um, from Dr. George Friedman, and it's a great honor uh, of mine to introduce Mr. George Friedman, who um, was a founder of Stratfor, an intelligence uh, company, back in 1996. Then 20 years later, he uh, moved on and um, founded Geopolitical Futures, another company of geopolitical predictions. And he's known of, uh, he's a known author of many books, including The Next Decade, uh, The Next 100 Years, or Flashpoints. And uh, for example, in his book written back in 2009, uh, it's called uh, uh, The Next 100 Years, he predicted uh, a, a new second Cold War between the United States and Russia taking place in the 2020s, so around this area, this time. So you can imagine that his predictions are uh, quite accurate. Uh, and actually, the end of his prediction was the collapse of uh, the second collapse of Russia, as, as it happened in, as, uh, with the Soviet Union, and then the rise of China and the rivalry between, um, uh, between the United States and China. So I think his message, uh, in, based on the, his previous predictions, uh, could be quite interesting. So I, I would like to ask um, uh, our technical help to uh, to, to start the presentation, and thank you very much. Sajnálom, hogy nem vagyok Magyarországon, de szeretnék Pesti lenni, de nem bírok. Majdnem egy háború van, itt, itt volt, hogy vagyok az otthonba, de nem lesz egy háború. És ez a dolgok mindig történnek. De kell nekem beszélni angolul, mert nem, nincs elég szó magyarul. So I'll speak in English. Uh, the topic that was picked was uh, Central Asia, Central Europe. And it's entirely appropriate at this moment, but we have to speak of it in a certain way. We have to start speaking of it about the Russians. And uh, what is this crisis that's happening? What is its dangers? What is its reality? And how does it affect Hungary and Europe? So first, we have to understand something about Russia. It is a very weak country. Its gross domestic product is the equal of the state of Texas in the United States. So one state of the United States has this an economy as large as that. This is very important 
to understand that economic actions are deadly to Russia. It has more military capability than economic capability. And so the conventional solution to a confrontation with a country like that is not to play to its strong point, but to play to our own strong point. And to understand the various threats that are going on, you must understand that their threat or potential threat of invading Ukraine is meeting, meeting a major economic threat from the United States. Sanctions on the Russian economy are very serious because the Americans will put sanctions on countries that trade with Russia as well, uh, which may not be fair, but is how what we will do. And the American economy is the largest in the world. It is also the largest importer of almost all commodities. Therefore, maintaining a solid, stable economic relationship with the United States is in the interest of Russia and of most countries, and also in the interest of the United States. The United States is not particularly interested in waging economic warfare. But under the circumstances that the Russians had to take, they took the fact that they have a stronger army than they have an economy and risked it. You have to remember that the collapse of the Soviet Union was greatly influenced by the fact they were spending huge amounts of money they couldn't afford on the military and not building their economy. In the same way, they're sort of in that position. But let's look at the world for the moment from the Russian standpoint. From the Russian standpoint, they are in an extremely dangerous position. They used to have borderlands uh, stretching all through the west, to the south, to the far east. And those borderlands were what saved Russia from the Swedes in the 18th century, from Napoleon in the 18th century, and from the Germans twice. The distance the attacker had to travel always meant that it got to Moscow in the winter. If it started in the summer, it would be the winter before it gets there. And there, Russia could defeat them. Today, the northern border of Ukraine is a few hundred miles from Moscow. So when the Russians look at the world, they look at the fact that they have been stripped in the fall of communism for, by countries that are critical to them, who are in many ways hostile to them. So where we wonder, why are they so interested in Ukraine? Why, why don't they forget it? It's because this was one of the countries that saved them from Hitler. Strategic depth is what they live for. For the past two years, Russia has quietly been using what I call soft force to rebuild its borderland. One place that we saw this happening, of course, was Belarus. Belarus and the North European plain, blocking the approaches from Poland, from Germany, from France. Okay? Uh, and what it did was, in this condition of a chaotic election, it moved in as arbiter and stayed. It is now not controlled by Russia, it is not owned by Russia, but it has a great deal of Russian influence. And this makes Russia secure. We saw a similar activity in the South Caucasus. The South Caucasus were the path the Turks used to take to attack. And in the South Caucasus, uh, in a war which Russia had some hand in starting, the war ended with Russian peacekeepers in the area. The Russians don't want to run the area. They don't want to make a mistake of having satellite countries. But they want to be sure that this region is under their eye and in the end under their control. We saw a similar action like that in Central Asia, in Kazakhstan, where really a, an outbreak of violence that I think was coordinated uh, caused the old regime completely out of the picture. Masimov, who is vitally important, was imprisoned, and someone who is pro Russian put in his place. Now, we can understand these actions. Understanding them doesn't mean it is in the interest of our countries to see it happen. 
So we have to understand that in foreign policy, it is essential to understand why the other side is doing something. You may even sympathize with them if you want, but action must be taken to block them. At the time all of this was happening, we recorded this. We said this was happening. And we also said, but nothing is complete until Ukraine is taken care of. Ukraine is the fundamental strategic necessity for Russia. And Ukraine is a vast area. And Ukraine is also the most important because if they hold Ukraine, then the borderland with Central Europe, what you call Central Europe, and I still call Eastern Europe, uh, is open. From Ukraine, they can bring forces to bear, obviously into Hungary, uh, bring forces to bear if they wish into Romania. They can move northward as they want. So if they get what they need, which is control of the Ukraine, the United States, its allies, is forced into a position back to where we were in the Cold War. With the Russians, we could see from Germany, you could see the Russians over on the other side. Remember that in their first note, it contained two elements. One was an element demanding that the United States agree not to put any weapons in the Ukraine, which is easy to do because we hadn't, not to bring them into NATO, which was easy because we hadn't. And there was another note that said that NATO forces should not be deployed in the Eastern Bloc, in what you call Central Asia, Central Europe. That it should not be, he wanted in that note to make certain that a buffer zone consisting of Poland and Slovakia and Hungary and Romania be created a zone that was empty in, in which he could exploit. And this is where this crisis became serious. With talk about the Ukrainians, yeah, all right, we can talk about the Ukrainians, but when his note contained an insistence that NATO not be engaged in Eastern Europe, that did not bring weapons there and so on, this ceased to be a purely defensive move and it became an offensive move. And in becoming an offensive move, America, that is a very inward country, suddenly woke up and looked at the stage and said, no, we're not going to do this. So it has to be understood that Eastern Europe was at the heart of how this crisis developed. Because the demands on Ukraine will be easily met. That's not an issue. The demand that NATO withdraw force from Eastern Europe was never going to be met. Putin, I believe, put that in there to have something to give away, not because he expected it. We didn't ask to give it away. It triggered our worst fears in the United States as well as in Europe. Okay. He had placed tanks, armored vehicles, all around the Ukrainian border. One army group was in the south, coming out of Crimea. Another was the east, really seeming to have his base in Voronezh. Uh, the other group from the north, from Belarus in that direction. Okay. This formation, we Americans amazed by, because we hadn't seen anything like Guderian fight invading France in 1941. First, it was an armored force. An armored force is very difficult to conduct an attack with by its own because it needs gas. Tanks weigh 50 tons. Some of theirs weigh 60 tons. Uh, and they take a lot of fuel to drive them. If they don't get the fuel, they don't go anywhere. If they don't get the ammunition, they don't go anywhere. And so they lined up in a World War II formation that clearly was designed for a propaganda picture. Because from a military standpoint, they knew, they're, they're excellent commanders, they understood that if war came, America would target not the tanks, but their fuel depots, 
If the fuel depots were blown apart, there was no fuel, there was no attack. Now, the United States said it would never do anything like that. But the Russians, of course, couldn't believe us. How can they believe that we wouldn't do anything? Maybe we would, maybe we wouldn't. And the same way, we couldn't believe that they weren't going to attack us with armor. They said they wouldn't, but what are they lying? So here were two, two sides, and the Russians were focused on the Americans. I know this is bad feeling for the Europeans, but they were focused at that point on the Americans. Because if you remember that note that was handed out, it was handed to the NATO commander and the American. The Americans got their own note. He, he wanted to make it very clear that he's holding the Americans responsible for this situation. And the Americans, we old guys kind of remember the Cold War, enjoyed it, said, wonderful, we got it. And there was a situation of unreality on all sides. On the American side, an unreality is that the Russians were trying to invade a country the size of Afghanistan with armored weapons that could be dealt with with missiles, air power, and their fuel knocked out. Okay? The Russians also were very surprised by the American response. We didn't say we were going to attack. We said what we're going to do is place sanctions on Russia. I didn't understand what that meant until I sat down with a financial guy who explained to me that essentially it would shut down 70% of the Russian economy. That part of the economy that has to be operated overseas has to have banks that are willing to transfer the money and so on. And that would be gone. But when we remember that its economy is only about $2 trillion, not just compared to the United States, but to European countries. This is a very small, poor country. So they were hitting us at the place we would become more, most frightened. And we hit them back, or threatened to hit them back, at the place they'd be most frightened. And so the entire thing went into stasis. But the Russians had another strategy, Germany. What they really wanted to achieve, even before they had Ukraine, was to break NATO. To break NATO into feuding elements that didn't cooperate and wouldn't uh, work together. And the expectation was that Germany would be that country. Because Germany depended on Russia for fuel. And if the fuel doesn't come, they said the Russian economy would fail, they would... But the Russians made a miscalculation. The Germans depend on two things. They depend on fuel and on exports. 46% of their economy is derived from sales to other countries. If those countries don't buy, Germany is in much trouble that it doesn't get fuel. Surprisingly, and interestingly, who is the number one purchaser of German goods? in the world, the United States. The United States imports Mercedes, Volkswagens, equipment, and everything else. We are a massive export-based, import-based economy. And we ex import all of these things. And Germany is one of our main, we're, we're its main customer. Obviously, the rest of Europe is a major customer, perhaps larger taken together. But if you look for the one single country, so the Germans found themselves in a very difficult position. The position they found themselves in was, on the one hand, they had to have natural gas from Russia. On the other hand, they had to have the American market. And then the French came into the picture. The French did something very interesting. They stepped in front of the Germans in dealing with the Russians. Where normally it would be the Germans, and the Germans did go there. He went there. Also, there was a delegation to Germany of German businessmen. This was a very important delegation. Because these were where the businessmen were saying, you're putting us in a possible position. You're threatening us. We're your friends. You know we like you. you buy, we buy all your stuff. You're threatening us with cutting off our oil. Or you won't cut off our oil if we cut off our exports to the U.S. You, you can't push us this way. 
You can't get us to where we want to go. It was very interesting to me that the most important delegation was not members of the foreign ministry or defense. The first important people were there were German businessmen. And what they were doing is telling Putin the truth about the world that he may have missed. This is not 1958. It is not uh, the Cold War. There's an economic dimension that you have to take into account. And this was the point at which I think the Russians realized they were in trouble. When the Germans wouldn't break, said publicly they stand with NATO, they stand with the Americans, and even let the French get ahead of them because that they hate under any circumstances. So what happened was that rather than split NATO, he solidified NATO. Only one country didn't join the solid, the, that solid force. I won't mention which country it was, but there was one country that didn't do it. Um, another matter to be discussed another day. Um, each country did what it needed to do. And the Germans realized it needed to bring this crisis to a close. And Russia was not going to cut oil because it depended on oil revenue, gas revenue, to keep itself going. So what happened was that the interlocking of economic interests uh, really gave the Americans a free hand because they were not an importing, uh, an exporting power. They weren't depending on anybody to buy their, buy their goods. If they do, it's wonderful, okay? We didn't have the same economic dependence. Now, the United States had no desire whatsoever to have a war in uh, Ukraine. It was insane. If we fight the Russians, it's not gonna be on their doorstep. <laughs> That's not the place to phase them down. But we didn't, we, I want to fight them, and we knew something else. The Russians didn't want to fight us. They wanted to get a piece of paper that showed that we had capitulated to them on something. We, he underestimated the American political system because Joe Biden is in no position to give anybody uh, that kind of paper. He couldn't do it. Uh, and this was partly the Russians simply not understanding the United States internally, nor that we really understand our national interest to maintain NATO and so on and so forth. So one of the great problems here was a residual inability of Europe to grasp the United States. We are not a European country. We don't behave like a European country. We are more wild and reckless, it appears, internally. But we know what our interests were, and our interests were we give nothing. In fact, we started saying very publicly that the Russians are invading. The Russians kept saying, no, no, we're not invading. The Russians are about to invade. What he wanted the Russians to feel, and this was going on, is U.S. forces were mobilizing. We were not intending to go to war, nor were we leaving it alone. And the way in which we would handle it would be with aircraft, missiles, and those missiles don't have to be launched from nearby. They can be launched from a thousand miles away on a submarine. And we have many submarines. So in most ways, we have a superior military force, even though in, our, in, our, in Afghanistan, you wouldn't have noticed it. Uh, you know, we had the ability to engage them. And Rush, the Russians then started talking about, you know, we're going to have to settle this somehow. There's a, there's a settlement we can have here. And I think that's true. There is a settlement. Uh, the settlement is that we will continue to promise to do in, in uh, Ukraine what we did best. We never let them into NATO. We won't let them into NATO now. We never uh, supplied missiles to them because you don't want to put missiles that close to your enemy because then you don't have any reaction time. You put your missiles in Scotland, if you happen to have missiles and the Scots let you. Uh, you don't put it there. So the, the way he did it indicated that he really 
was fishing for a reason why the United States should get out. And the American position is, well, we're not going to give you a signed note that we're abandoning. It's not a NATO member, but still a friend and a lie. That's, that's not going to happen. Now, something interesting happened in Russian news media yesterday in two places. In one place, a leading retired general called for Putin's resignation. In another place, it was a more minor former min, uh, foreign minister. Putin did this because he felt he had to. He had to restore not the Russian, not the Soviet Union. He had to restore the Russian Empire. That the empire they built in the 18th and 19th century that protected them, that saved them four times, that he as a KGB man looked at and said, how could this have happened to us? And for years he was thinking how to do it. And he thought he had the chance. Well, we can't deny him the security of Ukraine. Okay? This, this we can't deny him. It's too close to Moscow. Nor can we force the government to capitulate to Russia. That can't be the case. But please note in the way I'm putting it, Putin wound up in a situation that he was demanding cooperation from us to achieve fundamental national interests of his. And he was painting his weakness without intending to. I suspect there will be a settlement. It is altogether possible that the Russians will attack. If they attack, it won't be with the tanks. They have other better means of attacking. But to occupy a country like Ukraine, it's huge. Everything that can go wrong goes wrong in war. I have watched maneuvers of tanks. They break down. The fuel isn't delivered. The driver gets drunk, whatever. Only on paper does war go smoothly. And K the KGB man knows this. He's watched enough American maneuvers in his time to know that war is a dangerous risk and you can lose. All right? We did not think we would lose in Vietnam. Okay? But we did. And we shouldn't have because we were so powerful, but we weren't powerful in the right way and we didn't wage the war the right way. We are twenty billion, today $20 trillion economy. We can take losses. We can survive. Putin is in a different position. So I have no idea what goes on inside of the Kremlin, so to speak. I don't know what the relationship of Lavrov to Putin is. I don't know what the oligarchs are saying. But at this point, everybody's looking at him and saying, well, you put us in a hard position here. I assume he's still feared. He's still very powerful. But he managed for about two weeks to make it appear that it was his option of what would happen next. And then it turned around. And it really turned around when the Germans showed up. The Germans didn't want to be there. They didn't want to say what they said. They didn't want to go home and face their party members, but they had to. And now the United States has to find alternative means of getting natural gas to Germany. Germany can continue to sell whatever they want to sell to the United States and more. But now we watch France, the eternal game between France and Germany ever since 1871. Macron dreams of becoming De Gaulle. <laughs> and, you know, maybe he will. As to Central Europe, which you call Central Europe, Eastern Europe, I want to remind you of something. From the Balkans down to Romania, there are 87 million people living. And those 87 million people have a common interest. And the inability of these people to form a common interest simply on the question of defense, but to be constantly referring their, 
referring their futures to, how should I put it, to the United States, if you will, and expecting that this will happen. No country is powerful enough to determine its future, not even Hungary. Nothing in Hungary's history says it can do that. One of the mysteries of geopolitics is why this lesson hasn't been learned. And these 87 people, 87 million people, a massive population stretched in a strategic area of the world, cooperating economically, politically, and militarily, doesn't form itself. There was a saying in the United States at the founding, if we do not hang together, we will surely hang alone. And what that meant was, if we don't stay together, this was said between the revolutionaries, well, we're certainly going to hang. The history of this region is an inability to understand its power. The question that Putin was putting on Ukraine should have been put to the capital of this Eastern Bloc, wherever it is. And here we'd already have a fight between Budapest and Warsaw and Bucharest, and there it would end. And that's the problem. You live now, the country of my birth lives at risk. The time since the Cold War where it was only a question of money. Yeah, that time has passed. This is what it means to Central Europe. It means also that money is an act of war. The United States uses it that way. It means that killing is part of war. Any country that wants to split this region and making each country greater can do that. We go to Poland, we go to Romania. You go to Russia. In, in the end, where are you? Instead of part of a nation of 87 million, you're a nation of 10, maybe. So, and then you're vulnerable. I understand very well the history of the region. And I can say to you as a geopolitician, we don't care. The question is preserving your autonomy, and the safety of your children, and the viability of your economies. And what this event should remind you of is what the Russians demanded was that you be abandoned by NATO. No, he wasn't going to get it. He wasn't in a position. But that's what's in his mind. And if that's what is in his mind, you may believe that the best deal you can get with Putin is the best deal you have. But I will assure you that a good deal with Putin doesn't last. So for what happened right now, I say this passed, I think. I'm pretty sure. But what is left here is exactly what this conference is about. Central Europe. I'll call it that. What is the relationship of Central Europe to itself? A handful of tiny powers unable to control their future? A coalition to states to define their future? History has begun again. Welcome to the show. And we urge you this time to play the hand differently. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, that uh, was a spectacular um, a speech from what I would call the, um, the, the, the foreign team today, because we've had in uh, this conference an extremely distinguished group of um, people who are foreign to this country, who've come in from the United States, Canada, Australia, and delivered, I think, really powerful uh, speeches. We've also had an extremely... Um, distinguished group of Hungarians in, uh, in and out of government uh, in different ministries uh, with great diplomatic experience. Um, and um, they, too, uh, have performed, I think, admirably in enlightening all of us who are in the audience um, and giving us a really uh, clear-sighted view of the possibilities. Well, I think, in a way, we will, the foreign team will concede that was a masterful performance by their captain.
It was superb. And, uh, and, and uh, as w one of the organizers, Ishvan and Melissa are really um, more important than me on this occasion, I'm sorry to say, but uh, the, the organizers are uh, deeply grateful. Now, for the captain of the home team, I don't think we could have someone more distinguished or better in any way than Zolt Nemeth. Um, Zolt Nemeth uh, on the program is described, of course, as um, the, part of the chairman of the Parliamentary Committee on Foreign Affairs, and he's also the, uh, holds a distinguished position in the Council of Europe. Um, they're very important and very apposite to our discussion today. But of course, I also remember something else, um, because we've actually known each other quite a long time through in Washington and before, which is that um, in the 1970s, when a small group of, um, at the time, undistinguished students were uh, living in a dormitory, they formed a political party. And I believe that of the first three members of that party, which became Fides, the present governing party, um, the present head of the parliament, um, the prime minister, and Mr. Nemeth were one, two, and three. But I don't think you were three. I think you were two. So um, Mr. Nemeth has been, so to speak, at the very center of power uh, in this country um, since, uh, well, I'd have to say, um, 1998, um, and in periods of opposition as well. He comes with unexampled diplomatic, foreign policy, and domestic pol uh, political experience. He's the ideal man to come back on behalf of the home team. Zolni. Thank you, John and Melissa. We are very grateful to you for bringing this uh, audience and this group of lecturers together. Without you, uh, we definitely would not be here. The two of you merit our highest uh, recognition. And we are closing a period, an election is coming up. <clears throat> And uh, this has been an extremely important mission of yours. Uh, this is the right uh, form of uh, exploring what kind of contribution you have made to us, to Fidesz, to the uh, Hungarian uh, political thinking in the past years. Uh, thank you very much uh, to both of you. And uh, I had uh, a parliamentary day, a parliamentary foreign affairs committee meeting in the morning and in the afternoon uh, we had a, a plenary meeting, but I had my colleagues here and I tested uh, that whatever I wish to tell you is just fitting uh, the uh, summing up title. Uh, this today's conference can be seen as a kind of database, uh, data and mainly interpreted data, information about the functioning of the post-COVID world. In other words, data about the system in which foreign policy, especially the Hungarian foreign policy, must find how to best enforce its own national interests to find the optimum level. In order to find the optimum level, two things are needed. On the one hand, it is very essential to, to, to define what the Hungarian interests are under the circumstances of the given situation currently in the post-COVID world. On the other hand, it is necessary to assess very precisely what messages and actions can be used to move in an effective way towards the goals defined as the Hungarian interests. For both things, it is necessary to understand very precisely what the circumstances of a given situation are. In other words, in terms of geopolitics, what is the world in relation to which we define our interests? And at the same time, what is the world which determines our room for maneuver when seeking how to best enforce our own national interests? I think today's event 
uh, organized by the Danube Institute may serve as one of the sources of this understanding or uh, awakening. At the moment, uh, I am of the opinion that the COVID crisis has caused very significant geopolitical landslides in the world, but for the time being has not yet created a new world order. Certainly, today's conference database may show a different picture. We are living in a new version of the world order that existed so far. However, the current situation remains only one version of the world order on which the UN Charter is based. The world, the world order established in 1945, also known as the UN World Order. It is important to be aware of this finding because the UN World Order together with all its problems and shortcomings is a world based on fundamental values due to the charter of the world organization. It is based on four core values, peace and security. Secondly, the protection and enhancement of the global public good. Number three, human rights. Number four, the sovereign equality of nations. There have been a discussion about values uh, I have arrived by, and these are the political interpretation of the very same value system you have been talking about when discussing wokeness in a cultural or civilizational dimension. When we talk about international law or international norms, they are uh, exactly what is reflected in the UN Charter. The ultimate function of the four core values is to protect people and protect nations. I think this is advantageous, very advantageous for Hungary, for the conservatives of the West. Furthermore, it is in our very interest that this does not change. From the point of view of its operation, from technical point of view, it can be said that the world order can be changed or perhaps it must change. At the same time, it is very important that peace, uh, global public good, human rights, and the sovereign equality of nations do not start to be ruined or overshadowed in the new world order. What has changed, however, is first of all, uh, the acceleration of China's position in world politics. And allow me a few words about China. We might even understand those who are outraged that the pandemic has started in China and that China has become the biggest beneficiary of the whole process. However, it is also a fact that China has responded to the crisis with great discipline, successfully, and in a very well-prepared manner, both health and economic-wise. At the same time, the reaction of the Western world was undisciplined and therefore roughly unsuccessful if one of the parties in a rivalry is successful and the other fails, it clearly changes the balance of power in favor of the former. Of course, there are not only those who are outraged by this situation, but there are also those who are visibly pleased with this change because for a variety of reasons, they didn't like Pax Americana, which was formed since 1990 within the UN world order, as I said. They tend to describe the events of the recent years as a kind of wishful thinking, as a worldwide victory over the West by the powers that defeat Pax Americana. However, this is, we all know, is a very strong exaggeration. With the so-called rearrangement of world politics triggered, generated by the COVID, China uh, has not defeated the United States, but achieved its strategic goal of being the number two in the world, alongside with the number one USA. Moreover, it has managed to become 
such a number two player, which cannot be considered as avoidable factor for the US when deciding on global critical issues of security. This became very clear when shortly after the inauguration of Biden, of the Biden administration, there was a large scale, wide ranging US-China bilateral summit in Alaska. The two negotiating delegations first told each other all sorts of ugliness in front of the public, and then retreated behind closed doors and discussed at length. This Alaska meeting is of course just an episode, but it is a good indication that the tension between Washington and Beijing is real, but not total. Their relationship is characterized by a dialectic of tension and conciliation on world affairs. No one lives together with the USA in such a dialectic. No one will live together with the USA for a very long time in such a manner, just China. This has been a strategic goal for China for quite a few years, and it has now been achieved. It is primarily in this sense that China is the winner in the so-called post-COVID realignment rearrangement of the world. However, China is not only the win, not the only winner of these developments. The other winner is not a sovereign power in my interpretation, but a significant range or group of different economic actors. For example, it is not difficult to see how much the digital industry has won in the COVID crisis. Everything which produces profit out of using digitally uh, stored databases and everything that can make profit without harming the environment can also be considered as a winner of the rearrangement, global rearrangement that has taken place as a result of COVID. It is also true for China, but it is true for the US as well as for Europe, essentially worldwide. Some people talk about this as the new economy, as opposed to the old economy based on heavy industry and hydrocarbon-based energy production. The Bloombergs, for example, have been organizing series of events called New Economy Forum. For a number of years, in the spirit of this contrast, which is one of the most important parade area for political supporters and economic actors representing the new economy. Well, they are the other big winners of the COVID crisis. They are winners both in economic terms, think about the profits of the digital companies, and in political terms too. An example of the latter is the return of the USA to the Paris Climate Agreement, the greatest political success of the new economy. This move, the return of the USA, was possible because of the victory of the Paris-friendly Biden over the anti-Paris Trump as a result of the COVID crisis. Everything is interlinked. So far, I have only talked about winners, but don't get me wrong. It's not a win-win game. There are also definite losers. The relative loser in the COVID crisis, as I mentioned, is Europe. None of the global companies that make profits from digital databases is based or centered in Europe. Therefore, the acceleration of strengthening of the position of the digital industry has also speeded up the erosion of Europe's global economic importance. However, Europe is trying to offset uh, this process by trying to overtake and become a world leader in the other lane of the new economy, the green economy. I do not want to go into the details uh, of what risks are carried by this move. Let us come to the conclusion that today's European green radicalism is a kind of attempt to reverse the loss of the European continent's position in world economics and world politics. From a Hungarian point of view, it would be great if this experiment uh, succeeded 
because the structure of the Hungarian economy is very close to the ideal of the new economy, green-wise. That is why there is a concern in Hungary that Brussels should not overdo green radicalism and thus not dig the grave of the whole uh, overtaking experiment. For example, by setting unachievable expectations to countries like Poland, the largest Central European power, taking into account the fact that Poland's economic structure is much unfavorable than that of the Hungarian one. However, with the COVID crisis, Russia was even more unlucky than Europe. And now allow me a few words about Russia. Uh, Although Russia has its own technology based on digital uh, database, which the country uses quite successfully in the military industry, but Moscow cannot transfer this technological know-how to the non-military field, to the non-military industry. While they supposedly have hypersonic weapon, uh, which maneuvers in an unpredictable manner based on digital data, there are no global Russian companies in the digital sector, and we didn't talk about, uh, and uh, we did not talk about the complete lack of green economy in Russia. Therefore, the strengthening of the new economy has further eroded Russia's position in the world economy, and thus in world politics from which it has no chance to break out with the European green strategy. At the same time, being pushed into the shadow in world politics is much more painful for the Russian elite than it was or it is for Europe. Europe has become accustomed to the role of economic giant and political dwarf. Since the end of the World War II, this is the situation. But Russia played the role in the eye of the USA not long ago as what China has become recently. The situation is a main reason for the demonstration of military power around the borders of Ukraine, in my opinion. But Russia is not capable of achieving economically. Uh, it is trying to reach it militarily to return to the ranks of the powers that primarily control the world. In addition, the Russian imperial irredentism, in my opinion, plays just a secondary role in the current crisis in Ukraine. The current Russian military demonstration of power is an attempt to correct the so-called COVID rearrangement of the global order from a Russian perspective. This is a successful Russian attempt. Now the US takes the Russian military threat seriously and hold negotiations with them, but do it only with them, as we can see. Many consider this attempt to be unsuccessful because they think that as a result of the Russian behavior, the, uh, the USA has deployed even more troops to Poland and other Central European countries. However, with today's weapon systems, geographical proximity is far less strategic to a military superpower than the Russians claim. On the other hand, the few thousand of soldiers that the USA is now lining up in our region is a well-functioning tool in the hands of the Russian leadership to nurture a sense of danger that will discipline Russian society. The big question for Russia is what economic benefits it can gain from the current military demonstration. Surely there is such a thinking. It is not enough to be a factor in world politics, but it is important to fund the whole Russian Putin regime. Increasing oil prices temporarily with the uh, military demonstration, for example, is a serious Russian success, but cannot be sustained necessarily in the long run. It is therefore worth playing, paying close attention to the economic aspects of the Russian efforts and the economic expectations 
and the economic outcomes of the present situation, uh, what we are witnessing, and as it was said uh, by the predecessor uh, speaker. Last but not least, the victory of the new economy in the COVID conflict, especially in the context of the Paris Climate Agreement, also means the loss of the position of the old economy. However, the impact of the Russian military demonstration on the situation of the old economy is more than interesting. The rough beating of oil prices alone is not uh, very welcome for the old economy because it makes a green switch over more desirable. However, oil prices at their peak uh, will not last forever. On the other hand, the panic in Europe caused by Russia's move to close gas taps shows that whatever role the green transition or switch over plays, even Europe, which can be considered as the most advanced player in the green revolution, is unable to get on without fossil energy. This European experience is good for the hydrocarbon industry uh, worldwide. At the same time, the wind of the danger of an outbreak of war made the preservation of the heavy industry crucial. Let's look at the Polish-Czech coal mining environmental debate just in the past couple of weeks, when with strong EU help, the Polish and the Czech coal mining industry and thus the metallurgy of the two countries have almost beaten to death each other in the European court the number of Russian soldiers on the Ukrainian border increased to six figure. Warsaw and Prague found a compromise very suddenly. It is possible uh, to dream of a green Central Europe, but without Polish coal mining and Czech heavy industry, a striking Central European defense industry is unthinkable. Just look at the military industrial cooperation we are trying to pursue in the Visegrad framework these years. Summa summarum, it is in Hungary's interest that the world, and especially Europe, treat in a gentle manner the element of the global public good called environmental balance. But in the meantime, let us not forget the fundamental value of the world order called peace and security, in which NATO, with the principles, deterrence and dialogue, which will be reinforced very soon, play an extremely central role. In other words, Ceterum Censeo green policy must not be pursued at the expense of security. Hungary, Europe, and the West, in general, cannot afford it. Thank you very much for your attention. <laughs>